I would like to welcome you to this book discussion of Dr. Jonathan Trans, Asian Americans and the Spirit of Racial Capitalism. My name is Kwok Bui Lan from Kendra School of Theology at Emory University. Tonight's event is jointly sponsored by Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative, the Asian Theological Summer Institute, Kendra Foundry at Kendra School of Theology. I will first invite Dr. Tran to introduce his book, followed by remarks from four panelists who have worked on race and religion. Then I will invite Dr. Tran to respond to the panelists before opening to the questions from participants. Please post your comments and questions in the chat. So Dr. Tran occupies the George W. Baines Chair in Religion at Baylor University, where he has taught since 2006. In addition to the book that we are going to discuss tonight, he's the author of Foucault and Theology and the War in Vietnam and Theology of Memories. He lives in Waco, Texas with his spouse, two kids, four cats, and three chickens. Please welcome Dr. Tran. Thank you, Professor Kwak Pulan. It's an honor to be introduced by you. I think for many of us, you've served as a mentor for how to do this for a long time. So uh, it's great to be here and thank you for the sponsoring bodies. I thank ahead of time uh, the respondents. I really look forward to hearing from them and then hopefully some conversation with the various folks um, gathered tonight. So I, I want to just give a brief introduction to the book, especially for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Uh, Asian Americans in the Spirit of Cap Racial Capitalism is really my attempt to shift, if ever so slightly, the conversation on race and racism in America. Um, I do so from an Asian American perspective or the perspective of this Asian American uh, with the conviction that uh, my or our experience in these conversations, say conversations about race and racism, leads to an experience I describe as being marginalized by anti-racism after having first been marginalized by racism. I think that perspective at the margins gives us critical purchase on how to view uh, co conversations of race and racism. That is, rather than trying to squeeze the experience of Asian Americans into the dominant discourse and its binary logic uh, of white and black, uh, I think something that we've tried for some time now, uh, instead of banging our heads against the con that conceptual wall, I thought, well, why not take the perspective from the margins to examine critically the discourse? Uh, and I thought that doing so would render clear uh, why we keep on banging our heads against these walls and what new insights we can gain from looking at things from other perspectives. Um, this leads me to a large constructive picture, um, a large formulation about what race and racism amount to in American culture. I call this uh, following the black radical tradition racial capitalism. And I hear I draw on a number of thinkers uh, through the long line of black Marxism. My argument is that racism is fundamentally a mode of ideological justification for domination and exploitation. It's a way of gaslighting folks as a way to explain away systems of oppression, domination and exploitation. It takes local myths of race uh, and uses it to make respectable what are obviously deeply moral problematic states of affairs. Um, and so that's the big account of racism. Largely, I asked the question of what racism is by asking what does racism do? One of the driving programmatic questions around race and racism as I deal with it uh, raises the, revolves around the question, 
if it's almost universally agreed upon at this point that racism is bad, that it's evil, that it's destructive, then why does it persist? I then ask, what work is it doing? Uh, what role does it play constructively in our society? What does it enable? Who does it empower? Who does it benefit? Um, from that, then, I suggest that if racism is this mode of ideological justification for forms of domination, what we might describe as the deep entwinement of race and class in American society, um, and if I trace that those origins to the founding of this country, then the question for anti-racism is how do we go forth under a notion of racism as racial capitalism? And I suggest that we first need to deflate concepts of race as explanatory concepts for explaining what's going on. That is, we need to deflate race as a mode of analysis um, in understanding how our society operates. And then I suggest that if racism is a mode of exploitation, um, if it ha goes hand in hand with forms of American domination, especially under capitalism in its neoliberal forms, then secondly, what we need to do is offer different idioms of political economy. Uh, and here I turn to something I developed in the second half of the book, uh, borrowing from a number of liberation thinkers, um, what I call deep economy, an account in which uh, people participate in justice and mercy uh, as a way of addressing racial capitalism. And we do so because it's natural to the world insofar as it's natural to God. And I offer some examples along these lines. The argument proceeds by two very large case studies, an historical example um, that follows the reconstruction era in the Deep South, uh, what some people refer to as the most Southern place on earth, the Delta Mississippi, which is home to many things. But one of the most forceful homes it's to is what's often referred to as second uh, slavery, um, the Cotton Empire out of which contemporary uh, capitalism emerged. I look at the transplant of Chinese migrant workers as exploited labor who leave those conditions only to land into the world of racial capitalism where they enter into relationships with neighbors that is simultaneously profound uh, and exploitative. And I suggest that this is a powerful picture of how racism works. I think that we tend to exaggerate um, hyperbolic images of racism. We spend too much time thinking about them, uh, especially in their personalized form. Uh, this is a kind of commitment and addiction in the American psyche that racism is first fundamentally an individual affair and only secondarily, if that, structural and institutional. I reverse that causal explanation and suggest that racism is fundamentally structural and systemic and produces diseased imaginations. Uh, so then what you have with the Delta Mississippi is an account of profound coexistence with black neighbors, while at the same time forms of opportunistic exploitation. I suggest that going forward what in what I call uh, the racial capitalist aftermarkets, this is a pretty powerful and consistent account of how racism is operating in our world today. The second half of the book turns to an ethnographic study of a currently existing religious community, um, Redeemer Community Church in the Bayview Hunters Point section of San Francisco. San Francisco is often known as a hugely uh, progressive liberal area, uh, especially on issues of social justice. In fact, uh, the city is largely built on the marginalization of African Americans and previous to that, different forms of Asian Americans. And I study a church that takes part among other black churches, a church constituted mostly by Asian Americans who uh, make, neighbor, make friendships with neighbors and try to invest in neighborhoods and communities in ways that turn back the tides of racial capitalism. Um, in my, the story I tell, their life there is made possible, um, powered by how they read God's justice and mercy in the world. And try, so I try to tell that in uh, pretty significant detail. I deal with a lot of conceptual matters along the way, um, but I'm most interested in telling these stories as stories of hope and resistance. So uh, I turn it over to uh, Professor Kwok Bulan and to the respondents, and I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tran. And um, 
The first panelist will be Dr. Tammy Hall, who is an Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at University of California in Riverside. She's the author of Romancing Human Rights, Gender, Intimacy, and Power Between Burma and the West. She's currently working on a video project with Russell John, funded by the Harold Lewis Foundation, focusing on Asian American elders, religion, and resilience during the pandemic. Dr. Ho. Thank you, Pui Lan. Um, so uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Candler and Professor Pui Lan for organizing this book discussion. And I'm very grateful and honored to be included um, I will, however, preface my comments, uh, my brief comments to uh, foreground that I am not a theologian or a scholar who specializes in Christianity. Um, thankfully, uh, in our discussion group, there are scholars with those uh, skills and expertise. So my encounter with uh, Jonathan's impressive monograph stem from uh, my work in Asian American studies and post-colonial studies, US ethnic studies, and critical race studies, um, as well as my investment over the past two decades in uh, the scholarship of the Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative, which as uh, Professor uh, Kwok mentioned is co-sponsoring uh, today's event. Um, so APARI has sought over the last two decades to bring into productive conversation the subfields of religious and theological study and Asian American studies in the United States. So I would like to congratulate and thank Jonathan for this impressive uh, book, which seeks to challenge orthodox identitarian forms of understanding or rather misunderstanding race. Specifically, uh, Jonathan examines the model minority mythology and identitarian anti-racism and the limitations of the overdetermined binary of black and white, which Asian Americans have had to negotiate and live with since the 1800s. Instead, Jonathan offers us an approach that does not quote, press the case for racial kinds possessed of racial identities. Um, and I actually really appreciate this because uh, I was just listening um, last week to a talk by uh, Native scholar Kim Tallbear, who explained that uh, one of the problems with identity is that oftentimes in the United States, um, the tendency is to talk about identity as if it were property. And from a Native epistemological perspective, identity is not about something one owns, or something one possesses. Rather, identity is about relationships. And that's one of the things that I really appreciated about uh, Jonathan's analysis is the way in which he situates race within a kind of political ecology of race and Christianity and situates Asian American endeavors within the longer history of racial capitalism and religion which has often structured and reified whiteness with privilege, wealth, citizenship, and social mobility, and associates blackness um, with negativity, alienation, and uh, in, in many cases, unfortunately, social death. So through um, Jonathan's examination of the two uh, his case studies, as he mentions, of Delta Chinese during the Reconstruction era and Redeemer Church in San Francisco in the 21st century, as well as its associated endeavors of Day Spring Partners and Rise University Preparatory School. Um, Jonathan tries to uh, encourage his readers 
to think about a different imaginary, a different kind of moral vocabulary um, that puts identity at home with not only liberation, but also, as he mentioned, justice and mercy. So I thoroughly enjoyed uh, you know, the various chapters which move uh, from uh, an impressive review of scholarship on racial capitalism, Black Marxism, as well as um, uh, studies of whiteness and uh, also Afro-pessimism. Um, and then uh, associated with um, that uh, kind of impressive scholarly review, Jonathan presents us with very compelling um, stories about uh, Redeemer Church, about the Delta Chinese, and the different ways in which um, they both uh, did take uh, opportunities to uh, situate themselves kind of between um, the, the kind of white supremacist uh, context as well as um, the exploitation of African Americans who were primarily living in food deserts and therefore dependent on um, Chinese owned markets. Um, so I, I was intrigued uh, and I guess my questions for Jonathan are the following. Um, I was intrigued by Jonathan's um, uh, descriptions of different people who were involved in Redeemer Church, which is um, a 21st century endeavor in, located in San Francisco, as he mentioned in Hunters Point Bayview, which seeks to uh, recalibrate right, Asian Americans' relationships with their neighbors and to cultivate a kind of deep economy or an investment in both dispossession and joy, as um, Jonathan mentioned. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by uh, what in uh, Jonathan's um, description of Redeemer Church was uh, one figure um, that caught my eye was that of Cindy Fong, who he describes as um, a white female who um, participated in um, uh, helping to set up this kind of innovative endeavor, which uh, sought intentionally not to extract um, resources or to hoard resources, but rather to share them, right, with um, one's uh, neighbors and local environment. So one of the things Jonathan mentioned in, in his uh, description of Cindy was not only the degree to which Cindy um, sometimes takes on uh, the, the kind of burden of, of kind of white guilt and, and whiteness within a predominantly Asian American and um, mixed race uh, kind of uh, religious community, but also her history of working on uh, native reservations and, and with native populations. So I was curious if, um, uh, Jonathan would want to, you know, perhaps unpack or, or examine some of those relationships um, a little bit more. Uh, although I really appreciated Jonathan's examination of both whiteness studies and Afro-pessimism, uh, what I was struck by as I was reading his um, uh, analytic framework of deep economy and uh, political ecology was the ways in which um, his description of Redeemer Church, as well as Dayspring and Rise University um, was in, resonated with certain um, uh, native kind of uh, scholarship on ecology and mutuality and the ways in which, um, you know, uh, humans and non-human beings are connected. So um, I was curious if, if he explored that. And, and then also um, my other question was, 
I was also very struck um, by Jonathan talking about the different people, the different Asian Americans who and, and white folks who helped start Redeemer Church and their connection to not only elite institutions like Stanford and UC Berkeley, but also the Oakland um, Urban Project. So I'm wondering if uh, Jonathan could uh, tell us a little bit about kind of how did he choose which stories to spotlight and and um, if um, if he could speak a little bit to the way in which the Oakland Urban Project took these Asian American students um, coming out of Cal, coming out of Stanford, and offered them a very different experience um, uh, working in uh, impoverished uh, urban centers um, in Oakland, California, and the ways in which it transformed what could have been a potentially kind of model minority trajectory into one that is more focused on justice, mercy, redistribution, and reparations. Um, I also really appreciated, you know, the different stories that that Jonathan uh, shared with us, including that of Bobby Jway, who um, in who lived in Mississippi and kind of went against the grain of other um, Chinese market owners who, you know, perhaps did not connect as intimately with um, their black customers although they were willing to sell things to them and extend credit so um, to uh, accumulate their own profits and uh, financial security. But I appreciated Jonathan giving us examples of Asian Americans who chose a different path or, or had a different set of trajectories. Um, and then, uh, let's see. The other thing that I, I really appreciated about Jonathan's book was not only how he foregrounds the possibilities of coalitional solidarity and the kind of hope and joy that those endeavors can um, offer to us as we think about morality and ethics, but also his, uh, his kind of uh, analytical, rigor in also recognizing some of the limits of um, some of these examples, which would be very easy to kind of celebrate or to uphold as, you know, triumphant. Um, one of the things I particularly appreciated was how Jonathan's discussion of political ecology and deep economy, as demonstrated by the founders and members of Redeemer Church, um, was not able to ultimately think about ecology in a real kind of way beyond humans, right? Because Jonathan offers us a, a very um, detailed and, and compelling ecological history of San Francisco and the way in which the Bayview Hunters Point uh, region is the site of a toxic ecology, right? Uh, between manufacturing, militarism, et cetera. And yet Jonathan, you know, um, in his uh, description of Redeemer Church, recognized the ways in which um, their uh, innovative uh, forms of imagination and community building ultimately came up against limits in not being able to think about ecology um, in the context of uh, kind of um, human errors and, and exploitation of natural resources and non-human uh, beings around us. So um, I think I'll, I'll stop there uh, and hand it over to uh, the next discussant. But Jonathan, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking book. I enjoyed reading it. I look forward to revisiting some of the sections. Um, that uh, perhaps, you know, I didn't completely grasp the first time around, but really an impressive job. And thank you so much for uh, contributing a, a really, you know, rich conversation and uh, provocative exhortation to um, 
those of us who work at the intersection of Asian American studies and religious studies. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ho, uh, for your comments. Our second panelist is Dr. Songden John Opalan, who is Assistant Professor of Biblical and Theological Studies at Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg, Canada. His book, Memory, Grief, and Agency, compares Indian and US context of classism and racism to argue that wrongs today are better understood as rituals of humiliation, which are socially conditioned practices of domination, affected by discriminatory logics of the past and added against people who move out of place. Dr. Bopalan. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Kuk Puilan, for uh, envisioning this and bringing this together. Uh, like Jonathan, I have to say, you've been a mentor to so many of us, including me. Uh, and so this is just such a great uh, pleasure and honor to be part of. And Jonathan, special thanks to you as well. And I'll thank you again <laughs> when I finish my remarks here. Uh, and I should also thank the Asian Theological Summer Institute, uh, with whom I've had a good relationship. Uh, and also the other co-sponsoring body, Asian Pacific American Religions Research Initiative. Uh, and my own institution, a small university with a big heart, the Canadian Mennonite University. There's so much to say here, uh, Jonathan, so much, so much to say. When I began, I thought I'd have less to say. And by the time I finished my, uh, you know, formulating my thoughts, I, look, I'm more, I have so much to say. Uh, and I'm not obviously going to say it all, otherwise uh, uh, the organizers will simply mute me at the eight minute mark. <laughs> so I'm gonna choose maybe one or two things to say, and then I'll look forward to further conversation. Uh, so sometimes I'll say Tran, sometimes I'll say Jonathan, because I know Jonathan personally, but I also say Tran because sometimes I just do that. <laughs> so Tran offers a critique of anti-racism that operates on the basis of identity without paying attention to the class structure and deeper processes of commodification, right? He calls that kind of anti-racism, identitarian anti-racism. A quote from Tran's book that captures this for me comes from page 156, and I have the hard copy here. Uh, a thematic running throughout this book, Jonathan says, is the conviction that the work of anti-racism should not turn on questions of inclusion, exclusion, and presence, absence alone. Rather, the question needs to be exclusion from what? Presence for what? Identitarianism grants far too much weight to mere presence, or conversely, mere absence, and permits of anti-racist politics, the desideratum that one need only be authentically Asian American whatever that is given to mean, end quote. A very, very provocative quote there uh, from Jonathan. And I wonder, hmm, does identitarianism grant far too much weight to absence? If one organized a panel on Asian Americans in the spirit of racial capitalism and had no Asian or Asian American people on the panel, is such absence cause for concern? Of course it is. And that's not what Tran is after, I don't think. Uh, let me tell you a story about my father who many moons ago traveled to Abu Dhabi to start a new job. So here's a guy who's never traveled on the plane, packs his bags to go to the Middle East, is transitioning through some airport, some international airport, he's transiting, and then he's, you know, is surrounded by people in foreign places and he's looking around and he sees a brown face. <laughs> he sees a brown face and my father is Tamar, right? So I'm Tamar. My uh, father is Tamar, mother is Telugu. So he sees this brown face. He walks up to this janitor. He's a janitor in an airport who's cleaning the floor. He walks up to this guy and he says, Ninga Tamara, are you Tamar? And the janitor, lo and behold, says, yes, I am. And my father just hugs him in the middle of the airport, right? <laughs> my father hugs him in the middle of the airport and this janitor is telling my dad, sir, sir, please let me go. <laughs> my supervisor might not like this, right? Now, 
should my father not be happy that he found some Tamil representation in an international airport? Now, as someone who thinks about identity all the time, Jonathan Tran has certainly got my attention. So obviously I read the book, all of it, every page, every line, including the footnotes, which are great, by the way. But Jonathan's critique is deeper, deeper than the kind of thing that I'm trying to convey with my father's example. Let me describe what I think is one of Tran's central critiques of identitarian racism using an example he offers himself. This comes from page 221, where he talks about diversity, equi equity, and inclusion, DEI uh, initiatives. And, uh, and, and the fact is, DEI stuff is everywhere here. So this is an important critique, I think. According to Tran, the larger end of DEI discourses and practices following the ethical spark created by the civil rights movement is to dismantle structural and systemic injustice and not allow DEI to become a self-congratulatory and superficial therapeutic approach that is nothing but a photo op of sorts in which one can count off the right number of white, brown, black, red, or yellow faces, right? Such superficial approaches are what he terms elsewhere in his book as the inability to assess the demands of justice beyond the mere presence of people of color and count that in itself as a victory over against whiteness. Whiteness, uh-oh, <laughs> more on that soon, more on that soon. Let me register though for the record that in India, the place of my birth, and I still carry an Indian passport, right? So in India, the oppressors of Dalits, and I self-identify as Dalits, and Dalits are people who were historically both called and treated as untouchables in the Indian context, so in the, in the Indian context, the oppressors of Dalits and indigenous people are fellow dominant caste, brown people, right? So I am sympathetic to the argument that brown representation, for instance, is insufficient. It is for similar reasons that I stay away from the term people of color because it allows dominance to hide. It does not unmask dominance, it masks it. So when Tran calls out those who love diversity, inclusion, representation, multiculturalism, and the like, because it leaves their stuff, what Jesus in Luke 12 calls bonds and bigger bonds untouched. And by the way, that's a great quote from Tran's book. I agree and I nod my head in agreement. I nod my head in agreement. For Tran, the onus is on all of us across our various racialized identities to dismantle racial capitalism. Photo ops and superficial DEI initiatives are not going to do the work. In short, representation without justice is insufficient. On the one hand, I agree with Jonathan's critique. On the other hand, I do think aloud, isn't that what many have been saying all along? Anthony G. Reddy participative educator and liberation theologian who specializes in undertaking action research and participative observational work with predominantly poorer black communities in the United Kingdom notes, for instance, black theology is concerned with liberation and not solely representation. By this, I mean that black theology as a theology of liberation is concerned with the transformation of the black self and not simply the acknowledgement of its existence or to use Jonathan's phrase, not simply representation, but justice, right? So if representation includes justice in its inner logic, then all is good for Jonathan, right? Not quite, it seems, <laughs> not quite, it seems. Uh, this is where I think Jonathan's critique of identitarian anti-racism gets a little bit complicated for me. Let me offer what I think is a key quote uh, and here I'm quoting from page 13. In my approach, Tran argues, each racialized person counts the same as racialized and therefore commodified. There is not in this approach, some conceptually privileged racialized group, some uncommodified racial group, either on account of access to power or proximity to suffering. This is, I think, a key quote 
here is Jonathan saying there is not, in his approach, some conceptually privileged racialized group, either on account of access to power or proximity to suffering. Now, my question is, is Tran then going after one of the most important methodological categories in liberation theology, namely the epistemological privilege of the oppressed? If then, that is a difficult thing to swallow, right? That's where I might part ways a little bit. On the same page, Tran notes that identitarianism relies on vague concepts like whiteness. And that's a direct quote from his book, Vague Concepts Like Whiteness. Oh man, is whiteness a vague concept? To me, whiteness is as clear as the light of day. Even if I can't see it, I can feel it. I'm convinced, and here's where I part ways a little bit with trans analysis, that whiteness exists alongside racial capitalism, right? Here I'm thinking about Ekaputra Tupamahu's uh, essay, The Stubborn Invisibility of Whiteness in Biblical Scholarship, where he quotes Sarah Ahmed, who notes whiteness is only invisible for those who inhabit it. For those who don't, it is hard to see, hard not to see whiteness. It exists everywhere. I want to end, and here I'm coming to the last 60 seconds or so, by asking Tran a question that he asked himself, but in a slightly different context. So let me quote the context, and here's where I'm going to read a few lines from page 144, where he's talking about the Delta Chinese. And here, I actually, I'm in full agreement with Tran's analysis here, where he's talking about social sociologists who go and examine the Delta Chinese and say that the Delta Chinese are becoming white, <laughs> right? And Tran, in fantastic analysis, says, hello, here are the Delta Chinese who are saying, I." I'm not white. I don't want to be white. I want to be Chinese. I don't want to be white. And here's Tran saying, it is striking that their own words count for so little, end quote. And so Jonathan, I want to end with a question. Why is it that you say to those of us who say, we know what we're talking about when we say whiteness, that you say to us, we don't know what we're talking about, right? That's my question to you. Jonathan, I want to end on a positive affirmation here. You have given us many, many what you call new scripts to assess identity. And I will look forward to many more conversations over many beverages and meals and knowing you over some laughter as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bopalan. The third panelist is the Reverend Nihi Kim Kord, who is in her fifth year in the PhD program in Religious Studies as a doctoral candidate at Indiana University. Her research looks at the relationship between religion and race, Asian American literature and Christianity. She's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, USA. Reverend Kim Kord. Um, thank you, Dr. Kwok, and um, thank you all. It's an honor to be with you. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to engage um, Dr. Tran's work um, and to be in conversation with um, so many scholars that um, I respect and admire and look up to and aspire to, you know, aspire to be like. So um, uh, again, appreciate this opportunity. Um, so my thoughts feel fairly scattered um, because there was just so much in this in this book um, to deal with and to think about. Um, so um, that is just sort of uh, a caveat to this, um, but I did write everything out. So um, much of Jonathan Tran's book feels very um, resonant with so much that undergirds the field of Asian American studies. The Marxist critiques, um, the emphasis on, as Ray Chow explains, um, how labor, certain kinds of labor are conflated with ethnicity, um, I would extrapolate out to include race. Um, so the critical approach that Jonathan brings feels very important to bring into the disciplines and fields of theology and religious studies, and one that, um, again, I really appreciate being modeled in his book. Um, it really works to open that door um, to include these um, analytics um, in more of these kinds of conversations. 
um, one of the more generative parts I took away from this really impressive and um, comprehensive book is actually in a tiny sentence early on in the introduction. Um, this book captures both parts in a continuous narrative. That's on page eight. These parts, he explains, are the construction of race in order to ideologically justify political economic domination and exploitation and contemporary anti-racism's fixation with race. Rather than operating in a framework that relies on either identitarian um, anti-racism or post-racial colorblindness, Tran aims to tell a story about how these are actually twin phenomena that he argues can be better critiqued and engaged and addressed through the material processes of racialization um, rather than race itself. It's um, the continuous narrative, that linkage, that I find the most compelling. Um, it sparked a return for me to Black theories of race and the human. Um, and so I want to bring in, um, not that you need any more to add to your bibliography, but to bring in um, Alexander Wahalia's work and his terminology around um, racializing assemblages. So I've relied on his work to think through these theories of the human in relation to one of the more theorized ways that Asians in America are racializing. We all talk about this all the time. Um, and you talk about it in your book, um, The Model Minority. So I'll just offer a brief summary of what I hope will be useful here based on his work. Um, Wahalia explains that racializing assemblages are ongoing sets of political relations that require constant perpetuation via institutions, discourses, practices, desires, infrastructures, languages, technologies, sciences, economies, dreams, and cultural artifacts which bar non-white subjects from the category of the human as it is performed in the modern West. He begins from a black studies approach in order to illuminate the essential role that racializing assemblages play in the construction of modern selfhood and explains how they ascribe um, incorporeal transformations to bodies, etching these abstract forces of power onto human physiology and flesh in order to create the appearance of a naturally expressive relationship between phenotype and socio-political status, the hieroglyphics of the flesh. He argues these continuously shifting relational totalities are, um, and these are fun words, spasmodic networks between different entities and their articulation within acts and statements. The emphasis here is on the different axes of domination, these networks of relationality and productivity. And Mahalia picks up on this and is framing of, um, continuously framing of uh, racializing assemblages. They represent among other things, the visual mo modalities in which dehumanization is practiced and lived. And so the model minority myth is one such racializing assemblage, um, a visual modality that brings together expansionist and exceptionalist imaginaries solidified by racialized hierarchies, rooted in a category that conflates the human and whiteness. I raise this as a way to engage Tran's opening chapter on the model minority myth as he explains how racism uh, racism's meaning gets reformulated through a distorted dynamic between white ambition, perilous yellow migrants, and emancipated but still severely oppressed African Americans. And he's talking about um, the Delta Chinese. His argument is that the model minority myth becomes caught in a dynamic that goes nowhere. This demystifying refutation uses a formula that reinscribes the very image it seeks to displace. Ultimately, he explains his goal is to show the myth always works otherwise, that as a myth about race, it takes protean form and trades in slippery descriptions of all kinds and in every direction, each time in order to facilitate the continuation of racial thinking. I want to push a little on how he uses myth, and especially the ways that Christianity, theologies, narratives, traditions, churches, institutions, imaginaries, as a religion, how that's entangled with myths that undergird the construction of race. And so I wonder too, how this might intersect with black feminist work on myth and the human. And so I offer here um, again, a return to Sylvia Winter's genealogy of the human, um, how she traces it first from the supernaturally legitimated 
church, capital C church and clergy over the lay world. And then she explains the tactics of the affirmation of the human as a blocking out of any counter voice, um, especially here of a black counter voice, um, perhaps even of that sort of specific blacking out of that voice constituting um, the descriptive statement or the master code, which itself relies on um, the animus or the animacy from that blacking out. This blacking out catalyzed the various transformative shifts that occurred with the secularizing intellectual revolution of Renaissance humanism, followed by the decentralizing religious heresy of the Protestant Reformation. And this is, I'm quoting her, and the rise of the modern state. And so according to Winter, these shifts produce various iterations of the human, specifically of capital M, man, as a political subject, and then as a bioeconomic subject. And so um, I read Winter's theorizing of these shifts um, you know, even though she doesn't, um, I, I, I tried to build on that as an extension of um, these shifts as an extension of an ongoing theological conversion, a soteriological assemblage of notions of salvation and justification that subsume other structures of domination by extending that master code through the operative structures of those binaries we're trying to avoid, spirit, flesh, life, death, flesh, body, inside, outside, but all of this is theologically emergent, even in the process of Winter's explanation of secularizing, or what she calls de-godding. That is the reinvention of this Christian matrix in hybrid religion, secular terms, where she describes, um, whereas she describes man as the rational self and the biopolitical economic subject of the state now occupies the place of the true Christian self. So that true Christian self is, is still grounding um, this new subject. And so reading theologically, theologically becomes a way to address, um, for me, the multivalence of this persistent um, hybridity of the religious and secular as it manifests itself in these matrices of domination. So um, I bring in both Winter and Wahalia into the conversation because of this notion of myth, um, like the model minority, um, how how they emerge, how it emerges through various technologies. And again, I want to push um, on the, the theology piece. There's a point much later in the book where Tran, um, I think you sort of gesture to the role of Christianity and, and you, um, you uh, quote or you point to, for instance, Willie Jennings work and J. Cameron Carter's work. Um, but I want to continue to push on that a little bit more, um, how these theologies are imbricated um, with these uh, political economies, um, how these myths, these stories, and these, these sciences draw from, and I'm here referencing um, uh, Terence Keel's um, recent book, Divine Variations, something else to add to your bibliography. Um, what he says here, Christian patterns of reasoning about the abrupt solemnity of creation, human difference, and the universal applicability of a Christian worldview. And so the case studies that Tran provides us gives us a way to deal with the universalizing patterns of these kinds of myths as a driving force for the hierarchical structures of race and the dangers of sidestepping these effects. Um, there is something really compelling about these um, incredibly nuanced and very complex narratives, not only for the ways that they disavow either singular or binary modes of being and relating, but they offer flesh and blood liberative possibilities that do not follow, as Black radical thinkers say, the terms of order rooted in the universal as it is housed in the Western man and the over-representation of man that shape our world. So I find um, the most theologically compelling trans statement um, on page 207, the interconnections adjoining a Christian spirituality of liberation mean that the primary political key of Christian worship is not resistance, but proclamation, a radical narrative that shows us that the key to abolition might possibly be in the linkages and the assemblages. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Kim Court, for your comments. And uh, now we have uh, the last uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Woody Russell, 
is associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies in UC Santa Barbara. His primary research and teaching interests are in race and ethnicity, focusing on Asian American and Latinx religious traditions. His work has evolved into questions of authority in science fiction and first contact. His most recent publication is an co-authored essay on Asian American spacefarers and transcendence. Current projects include a book on Asian American religion and recovering exotericism in Latinx religion. Dr. Busto. Thank you, Professor uh, Kwak Pilan. I want to, you know, just thank you so much for put, pulling this panel together and for accommodating uh, the my time frame. So uh, much thanks to that. I also want to thank the Canada School of Theology and the APARI group uh, for uh, co-sponsoring this. Um, I want also want to thank uh, uh, the previous three speakers who were very quite elo eloquent and organized. Um, Maybe, they, maybe you put me at the end because you know I'm a little bit disorganized and tend to be a little uh, uh, curmudgeonly and grumpy. So, um, you know, which might lead into some interesting conversations. So first of all, I wanna thank you, Jonathan, for a really spectacular book. And I mean spectacular in several ways, spectacular in terms of display, spectacular in terms of performance, and spectacular in terms of erudition. Uh, you know, the, the, the footnotes are, uh, are daunting and uh, my favorite line from the footnotes occurs on page eight, footnote twenty-one, where it's not where you say in a in a in a uh, clause, "I do not tarry with any interlocutors for long," right? So, you know, it's, you know, which 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 accounts for the the the, the breadth of your of your your theoretical apparatus here. And so I wanted to to just uh, be, you know begin there because I think that that you know for me um, um, your book was in almost every conversation I had at the last AAR in San Antonio. It, you know, the, you know the, the the book came up, the, the the idea came up, the title came up. Have you read? Have you read? Have you read? So of course I had to Amazon it immediately and um, uh, sat down to read it. And I have to confess that I was a little bit confused at first when I started reading it because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And that is, that is, um, um, I thought it was going to be uh, uh, mm, a straight up sociological uh, theory book. And, uh, and, and I have to confess that when Puilan asked me to be on the panel, I said, well, I'm not really even sure that I understand what the book is about. <laughs> So she had to, you know, sort of like, like, you know, in, in her, in her, in her gentle but firm way, just kind of give me the, the bottom line about what it was, uh, you know, which of course uh, just meant that I that I had to read more carefully, and I have to, I also have to confess that it's taken me a long time to read this book because uh, because it is so dense, and um, the you know the the access to the book you know could be could be an issue, in terms of in terms of readership because uh, it is it is quite quite complicated. Um, I do appreciate the fact that that um, you uh, employ a number of methods, including uh, ethnographic uh, work, um, both both in terms of interviewing people in the Chinese in Mississippi, but also at Redeemer Church and the and its para ministries, but but and also the histor your historical recovery of of the Delta Chinese in and of itself, and and then earlier this the argument you make about how how blacks were the first. Uh, model minority, which I disagree with, but I will we'll talk about that in a second, or I disagree with it, 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 in terms of a nuance. Uh, so, you know, so, um, 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 I, you know, I'm, I'm the old guy on the, on the, the panel, you know, so my brain works a little bit um, uh, differently, if not antiquated. So, you know, for, you know, for me, uh, uh, trying to grasp the, the, uh, the arc of your book, uh, uh, Meant that I had to. I had to. I was sort of blown back, like you know, like 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 uh, that, that like the, like the angel of history back into a, a safe space, and and that was of course um, a, a book which you cite very early on, but don't, but don't really talk about that much, which is which is Michael Omi and and Howard Wine's racial racial formation uh, in the United States. You know, and you know, and for me, um, uh, the racial uh, Omi Wine, you know, remains 
a pretty important text because of, because of the because of the the the, the malleability of its of, of the theory of racialization and racial projects. Uh, um, I you know I, I understand there are critiques of it, and I and I and I I, I really like the fact that you that that you, you said very early on that you were you know trying to shift the conversation slightly. I, I think I think you actually are more, are more ambitious than that, and the book actually is is you know sort of pushing <laughs> everything else over into into another paradigm, which is great. But I, you know, but I do have questions. Um, um, uh, so, in terms of in terms of the Omi One framework, um, um, you know, I see I see your your text as you know in in their in the way that they their first part they they parse the different um, schools or paradigms of race and ethnicity, and I, you know, and I sort of see your book within the um, the the. What sort of the, the the nation framework, but also the, the 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 class framework in terms of in terms of the the way that 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 the idea of uh, 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 racial capitalism operates, you know. So you know. So 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 in that sense, uh, you know. You know. Once I kind of made that made that 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 perhaps unhappy framing from your perspective, uh, I was able to to engage the text in a, in text in a, in a much more familiar way for, for myself as somebody who, you know, who was, who was trained uh, in the, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, so, you know, so, um, uh, so, um, so I see your, 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 your model as, you know, as, as coming out of this idea of, of class paradigm and a market approach, but also the nation approach, which has, to, which begins with, with, with the notion of colonialism. And it was curious to me that one of the things that you didn't, that you didn't use in your, in your book was Robert Blauner's 1970 uh, racial oppression in America, because because you know you know as a as a Marxist sociologist, Blauner uh, accounts for race distinctions based upon uh, 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 political economy, but also culture, and also and also historical factors, right? So there was so, so there was a you know per, you know there there, there might have been an, an 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 easy access ramp for you by going through Blauner's chapter three, uh, uh, where, he, where, he, where he parses the difference between what he calls uh, colonized minorities versus, uh, versus uh, uh, immigrant, uh, ethnic immigrants. And so, you know, so, um, so I was really uh, um, kind of surprised that, 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 you didn't, that you didn't begin there. Um, you know, and, and in, the, in, the, these, in the way that Omi and, and Wine talk about these, these models is, you know, is they, is they, they do say that, that in each of these models, which I, th which I think you would agree with, that, you know, that race is a kind of epiphenomenon or, a, or, or the production out of these models. So, you know, so, so this, this idea of racial capitalism really, you know, is really, um, uh, uh, you know, a Marxist model, which, where you have the, sub, the substructure and the superstructure, you have, the, you have the, the material realm, and then you, have, then you have the world of ideas, you know, and that was very clear and very powerful in the in the text um i'm not i'm not sure that all of the 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 filigree the curly cues around around that actually uh made that argument easy to easy to 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 grasp grasp there were times in the in the text where i had to you know had to find a a, a hook sentence you know that that sort of like summarized and explained for me so you know so that's one thing so you know, the other thing that that the text reminded me of and which i also saw saw that that wasn't in your bibliography was uh was the use of ron takaki's book iron cages which is an which is an historical uh horizontal look at race in the, race in, in the united states and in his in in his most in the last edition um, his last chapter on the on the deindustrialization of America, you know, has a very very nice exploration, if you will, of the way that race um, uh, means in terms of the changing changing American economy once once we no longer make widgets, but also that but also that we we turn to you know to new forms of 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 uh, of widgets of information, et cetera, right? So you know, so he would have much to say there. So so I was and so I so you know so but, but, you know, but I but I very much saw. Your work in the in the in the tradition of, of of the black Marxist tradition, which was you know which is which is which is always a good thing and very strong. Um, okay, so 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 I, what I really like about your book, because I because I did like your book, uh, although I'm you know although although I'm grumpy about it, it, you know, is that 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 religion you know religion is, is is a central feature here, and I was I was a little bit worried at the beginning when you seemed to conflate or elide Christianity with religion. And it seemed to me that 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 uh, you know that the model might not work if it wasn't Christianity, I mean because of, because of the theological uh, move that you make. And you know you do, you do say at the beginning that the book is a is a, is is a piece of constructive 
theology, a constructive Christian theology. So, you know, so, so, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't complain about, about that, but it just seemed to me that it just seemed to me that, that there was a, there were assumptions about Christianity in the text that, you know, that, that kind of made me uncomfortable at points, uh, as a, as a, as someone who was actually raised as a Southern Baptist, <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Southern Baptist, uh, the Chinese historical chapter, they kind of made me uncomfortable because it, it felt to me that, 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 uh, that there was a little bit of um, evangelical bashing at that point, and that, you know, that, that you seem to think that the, that the, Chin that, that the Chinese Southern Baptists were, were somehow deluded or could not see their, their own oppression uh, because, you know, because, because they were caught in the, in the aftermarket of, of, of that historical system, right? So, you know, so what, so what, I, you know, was, what I wanted to see was, you know, were voices from the Chinese themselves who were not talking about religion, Southern, you know, uh, uh, evangelicalism as functional, like we do it because, you know, we get, con you know, that old sociological model, but, you know, but, but about how, you know, how, how the religion uh, gave them solace, you know, how it gave them hope, how it, how, you know, how, how Jesus was close to them. Uh, you know, that, you know, so, uh, I mean, but I understand why you didn't do that, but it just, it just kind of rang a little bit, a bit, a bit weird for me. But what I did like is that, that religion in the, in the book, plays an ambivalent role, right? So, so, it, so just to, to reverse what I just said, you know, the, you know, the evangelicalism in that chapter becomes, becomes this moment of, 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 um, of a missed opportunity as I think, I think, I think you, you, I par I'm par paraphrasing you. And, you know, and then of course the, the latter part of your book is all about the, 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 the full theological exploration of what's happening in the, in the baby hunters point. Um, so, you know, so, uh, you know, I would see your book as, as, um, you know, as um, in the lineage of of these attempts to try and and write and write and, and write a Christian Marxism. Uh, previous speaker talk about speaker talked about the you know the, the, the liberationist tone in the, in in the end, and the problem with maybe privileging the the oppressed. But I, but you know but for, but for me it was it was more a matter of uh, more more the, the 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 privileging of a of a of a utopian hope. You know that that is being that is being played out in the Bayview Hunters Point. Um, you know, and you and you you and but what I saw in that part in that chapter was was a, a kind of I don't know a, a skillful evasion of the problems of gentrification. You, you do address it, but it, but it seems to me that 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 the 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 the, the, the um. Uh, the, the the thick description of the work that and the para ministries of Redeemer Church, there uh, um, tend to you know from a from a rhetorical perspective tend to tend to overshadow the actual demographic transformations. Uh, uh, you know, fifty years ago, Baby Hunters Point was seven percent uh, Asian and Pacific Islander. Now it's now it's almost fifty percent. And and you know there's you know there has to be an accounting at some point of 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 Asian Americans in you know in their church coming from Berkeley and Stanford etc. You know they're doing something for the for the people and you know and that that will lead me to I guess I guess perhaps my my last point which is which is um, um, you know I've been I've been reading a lot about Manichaeism lately uh, it's become it's become my kind of um, a hobby, actually, and I'm trying to I'm trying to trace Manichaeism across Asia, down to down into southern China, and then oh, and, the, and then as it as it as it may have jumped into the, into the Philippines. So it's a kind of a weird project for me. I, you know, I I, it, I don't have Sogdian, I don't have Middle Parthian, you know, I, I don't have Chinese, but I'm doing it anyway, right? Uh, anyway, so 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 I'm so I'm I'm thinking about binaries here, right? So 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 the the text attempt to escape this black white binary is 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 wonderful. It's laudatory. Uh, you know, and then and you do make and then you do make good use of of of, of Claire Kim's triangulation model. But it seems, but it seems to me that 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 that, uh, um, and this is where I'm, you know, I'm kind of grumpy about about you know uh, about it is that 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 black people seem to hover in in and around the text in an uncomfortable way. You know, they they literally subtend your theoretical your theoretical apparatus. You know, and then and then and then you drop this very heavy heavy theological discourse onto the Bayview Hunters Point. Uh, uh, the Delta Chinese, uh, the 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 attempt, the your your reading of the model minority myth, um, um, trying to you know trying to 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 say that 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 actually African Americans were the first model minority myth, could be true. But I think but I think in in your parsing of the of the one two three points. 
one of the one of the things that 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 is different between between the this the black historical moment and the Asian American mob minority is that that in the in the Asian American mob minority threat, it's about it's about um, uh, Asian Americans out whiting whitey, and that was that was not necessarily true in the nineteenth century with 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 freed slaves with African Americans. You know, whites weren't afraid that white that 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 blacks were going to outdo them. The way that in the 20th century, whites became afraid that Asian Americans, because, because of their economic power, because of their educations, were going to outdo whitey. So, you know, so there's so there's a there's a there's there's an interesting way in that there's an interesting um, place. Let me put it that way: that that African Americans play in your in your in your in your book that is that for me is also a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and so there's a kind of binary that so so in, in, so in escaping the black white binary. What's I think what's happened in the text is is you've kind of put a black Asian binary in, in its place in order to, in order for your model to work and and you know and I and uh, my suspicious reading of the text uh, uh, leaves me with a little bit of discomfort. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the panelists for the wonderful and rich comments. They are all reading the same book, but they read it from their own perspectives. Uh, because of their interest and their training and their disciplines. And we have many questions uh, raised by the panelists. So I just want to invite uh, Dr. Trent to uh, uh, briefly uh, respond to some of them and uh, so that we have some time for questions and comments. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for the comment. They're, they're, they are so rich uh, and deep and varied. Um, I can't uh, even begin to try to do justice to them. Uh, I do begin by saying thank you. Um, so there's so much in each of them. I, I imagine we could have multiple conversations following each of the responses. So let me just say a few things about each in the service uh, in the interest of trying to also open up the conversation to other people on the call. So I'll, I'll go in reverse order. Um, and again, I'm not going to do justice to all that was put on the table. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Busto. You're, you're a legend in this world. So it's, it's an amazing honor to have you respond to the book at all. Uh, I admit I have, I thought a lot of times, I'm not sure what this book is <laughs> while writing it and in the production of it, um, what, what, how, how, to how to place it politically or to how to imagine which genre it operates in or even which discourses it claims to be. Uh, are, it's articulating its arguments through. Um, so uh, I, that's also something I liked about the book or writing this book is the attempt to uh, offer a set of concepts and theories uh, at the intersection of multiple um, discourses. So, um, so that's to say, uh, I acknowledge it's hard to place the book. Um, I like that a little bit about the book, but I can see how it would lead to some frustrations in trying to understand what is this, what is this book and, and what is it doing? Um, about religion and Christianity, yeah. And, and one of the really great questions you raise is does my theory work without uh, Christianity being the, the stand-in religion? Uh, and uh, you know, you can imagine how those cons how cr Christianity and say concepts of what religion is, how they inflect each other, but also how they confuse and uh, put significant pressure on each other. Mm -hmm. I, I will have the opportunity to test this theory. Um, actually, uh, I think, as I mentioned on social media the other day, uh, some friends of mine uh, and I are, have just received a significant grant, and we're going to try to see how religion is operating in uh, immigrant Asian American communities who claim some form of religion. And we're really interested, really, in your question which is, are the theorizations of religion sufficient for understanding what's happening in those communities? Or, or even are the theorizations of justice sufficient oh. uh, for understanding those communities? So your question is a live one. Um, I think I met religion in a passing way in relationship to St. Augustine's notion of religion, uh, Christianity is the true religion. Clearly that's a kind of valorization that you uh, and others may take issue with. and. Uh, insofar as I claim that, then I'm, I'm I'm happy to live with it. But I think your question is is a salient way. Um, yeah, the question of uh, uh, the evasion of uh, gentrification. How do you think of of Asian Americans in Bayview Hunters Point? Um, it's not that different, right? Than how you think about 
uh, African Americans in the Fillmore district, or how you think about any of these communities in um, formerly native lands. Um, yeah. So I tried to complicate this question, uh, returning to something that um, this relates to something that Tammy says earlier about uh, identity and property. And I, I try to compl complicate or at least raise significant questions around how we think about these questions. That's to say, your question seems incredibly important and right. Um, I want to situate that question among other questions of how we understand landedness, placedness, uh, and whether we have the sufficient imagination to raise these questions given the power of capital and how we understand land, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't change the, the question. I, maybe the most salient thing you said, and I'm just kind of rushing through things here. Uh, uh, the thing that maybe is the most haunting is the thing that was most haunting to me in writing the book, uh, how to talk faithfully about um, people that's not me, and namely African-Americans. Oh. Oh. Um, uh, well, on the one hand, um, drawing significantly, as you said, from the Black radical tradition, uh, using my theorizations, uh, de developing my theorizations through theories of Black Marxism, um, telling stories of African Americans in relationship to Asian Americans, telling them in explicitly and intentionally uncomfortable ways, hmm. um, without also valorizing deeply in deeply problematic ways or rehearsing deeply problematic political tensions in terms of how we understand ourselves. This was a risk, I, this was the risk that kept me up at night and you named it. Um, I did not know if I had the skill to sufficiently hold these things um, in proper relationship. Um, I imagine that I imagined that I did not, um, but that's what I tried to do. Uh, it's hard for me, uh, I hope I haven't taken a Manichaean approach. I appreciate your attention to that question. Uh, what I've tried to do is put, um, I think what I've tried to do is be honest about the history. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whether I was honest enough, I think is one of the questions you raise. So, um, or, or whether someone could be honest enough or what it would mean to be honest about this relationship. But I, I do really appreciate the insight and observation there. Again, I could say a lot more. I, I would just love to hear more of your thoughts. Uh, Reverend Kim Court, uh, I wanted combine something she was saying about mythos um, uh, with something um, Dr. Ho was saying about ecologies and what I tried to imagine were the background metaphysics to uh, Christians living into an account of justice and mercy where the primary political key isn't resistance but proclamation. There it's really a reflection or an intervention on what I imagine to be the very hard lives of those committed to issues of material justice and redistribution and repair. Um, and the, the kinds of metaphysics or in your language, um, the kinds of mythos, not in the sense of being false, but imaginaries or stories that one has to imagine oneself participating within uh, to make these sustainable forms of life. Um, I think resist, I think it, I don't want to um, make resistance and proclamation opposites, but I do want to claim that resistance language is internal to participation language theologically for Christians. Um, and I think that's where I, I would draw a, do, a distinction between me and say certain Marxist accounts, uh, as I kind of, as you all know, as I develop in the end of the book. What I try to say there is Christians aren't, you know, uh, waiting for a revolution to start, but laying claim to or leaning into one uh, 2,000 years in the making. It's a way of saying that the fight for justice and mercy isn't an unnatural thing, as if justice and mercy were the outlier in our world, even though it seems like that. It's the attempt to imagine the world as if they were natural. And so the outlier, outliers with things like predation, oppression, domination, et cetera, et cetera. Do not let those forces uh, have the first or the last word, as it were. Um, uh, Dr. Bupon, I mean, I always love interacting with you. You're so um, engaging and so generous and charitable. I mean, the representational politics are hugely important. How do we, how do we think about representational politics, especially as they're operative in our institutions, including institutions of higher learning and religious institutions of higher learning? without um, ending in forms of representational politics where there, where DEI becomes not simply a diversion from reparative justice, but in sense, some further assault on it. Uh, that's one of the significant things I'm trying to deal with in this book. 
I think what I would take the virtue of your comments would be is in part the recognition of that distinction. Or I don't know that distinction exists uh, in many places any longer, that there is a clear uh, alighting uh, or just sim simply the presumption that DEI is justice, or maybe it's a modest claim um, that it's the best form of justice we can get. And I want us to, I want to push us further and imagine other possibilities. I think we're the same in this. Um, uh, and, um, but I think you, you raise some excellent questions about whether certain concepts or discourses should be a re remain alive. And I, I, I think maybe your question is something like, does Jonathan sometimes throw out the baby with the bathwater? I think that's part of the comment about whiteness. I've become increasingly suspicious that whiteness language um, work, well, maybe the modest version of what I'm saying is it doesn't do as much work as we think it does, hmm. nor does it do as much work as often as we use it. <laughs> so uh, we see, we use it uh, as if it does more work than it does. And I think it actually often conflates things or confuses things. I think it's a deep mistake strategically, politically, um, to a set, to use language that makes white racial identity uh, seem essential or necessary properties of certain persons. Um, I think the better what we can do is to narrate the history of race and white identity uh, as tied to political economic realities uh, that make the um, destabilizing of those ID identities more likely than not. Um, mm -hmm. And my fear is that whiteness language actually goes the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. um, my worry is that I, I don't wanna spend more time telling white people that the most important thing about them is that they're white. Uh, I think they've told themselves that long enough. Um, and so uh, how do we destabilize that while also naming privilege and power in the way that you very rightly want us to. So, um, uh, Dr. Ho, I mean, there's so many things I can say to me. I mean, um, I really am glad you picked up on this, the, the powerful, I think the very powerful story, her story is powerful, whether I tell it powerfully or not is, is, up to, is a question, but Pastor Cindy Fong's ex existence in that church, uh, in some ways I'm trying to offer a mirror image, image, Dr. Busto, to the Asians in a black part of the city, to a white person in an Asian church, a mostly Asian church, and I'm trying to look at the kinds of dynamics that are operating um, that can be mutually informing and in how we think about these sets of questions. Um, but, you know, you asked me, how did I choose to, st to tell the stories I could have, I told when I could have told many other stories or told the stories I told in different ways. Yeah, these are the kinds of, as many of you know, the kinds of prudential judgments you, you think about a long time in writing books and a constant question, uh, um, and this goes back to Dr. Busto's discomfort with the presence of African Americans in my book. Uh, a big question is: is do you tell the story with the proper sophistication that that it warrants? Mm -hmm. um, I found that the writing of the ethnography, the telling of stories, the marshalling of arguments and concepts and theories, uh, to be incredibly difficult and challenging work, where the where it bore on questions of integrity and how you imagine yourself as a, as a theorist, as a writer, as a thinker on, on questions of enormous sophistication and complexity. Um, I think I tried to, I, I think I did so in ways that does work, but it I'm sure raises significant questions throughout. So I'll stop there. Um, I'm really interested in what other folks have to say. We have time for that. And again, I cannot thank enough the respondents. I'm, I'm deeply uh, in your debt for the questions you've raised and the observations and comments about the book. Thank you very much. Um, now we are open to questions from the audience and you can, of course, uh, put your questions in the chat and you're also welcome to uh, raise your hand so I can invite you uh, and uh, you can unmute yourself and then you can ask the question. Maybe I ask the first uh, question. You have written and also edited several books. Some of the books are more philosophical, like the book uh, Foucault and Theology. And this book, as you said, you have uh, chosen uh, to use ethnography.
Can you tell us the challenges of uh, using ethnography in doing theological work? Um, do you need to be trained or pick up the research method? How did you decide that you are going to uh, use this method and write a book like this? Thanks for that question. I mean, my primary area of research, and I imagine um, any number of scholars can list uh, different books that Tran should have consulted to make his book a better book, or at least uh, less uh, less omissive on certain um, critical discourses or, or topics or authors. Uh, my, my primary area of research is not ethnography, sociology, it's not even the uh, it's a religious ethics per se, it's, it's ling linguistic philosophy, I think, in terms of how concepts work. Um, and, I, and the most salient connection to race thinking is in the, um, the historical sociologist Audrey Smedley's concept of conventionalization. And so uh, my, that led me to some significant strong suspicions of the way a lot of race theory works um, as if, and specifically in recent years in theology, where the ideas seem to float, float free um, of their material expression, rather than rather, I imagine language operating through forms of life, uh, concepts gra find grounding in those kinds of ways, uh, and so I began with that uh, and thought then the way to flesh to flesh out the theory is by examples. This is just Wittgenstein's point that examples is what we have. Keep on looking, keep on specifying, um, and so I that's what that was about. Uh, as to the training, um, I kind of made it up as I read along. I mean, went along. I read a number of ethno ethnographic theories. I mean, ethnography was a very live question during COVID when most 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 of this was written. My, this was supposed to be in person observation, um, you know, mixed methods. But COVID made it largely through about twenty hours a week on Zoom with those folks. Um, I did some similar things with the Delta Chinese folks, um, but I do think that you know, speaking to this larger question of ethnography, uh, there's a significant ethnographic turn in in religious studies, and I think this is super important uh, because it will tie us back to the question of conventionalization or how concepts are lived uh, and their material expression and how we begin to think our way out of certain concepts. One of the big claims I make in the second half of the book is insofar as um, concepts are lived, then we need to have different structures um, and systems uh, to give birth to different imaginaries, different mythoi, uh, different myths of the world, or different ways of imagining our lives in the world, so. I saw that uh, we have participants from UK, from Hong Kong, and also from other places of the world. And uh, Jonathan, do you think that your book might have some relevance uh, to racial minorities living outside the United States? I know that your research is mainly on Asian Americans. I would think so. I mean, I, I think I tried to give an account of how race works as a transnational uh, phenomenon, uh, deeply tied to issues of migration, um, and so, uh, and, and I think the, the operations of race at least are relevant across the Atlantic. Um, I, in the book, began talking about the UK or England. Recently, I've been drawn by uh, Tyler Davis, who may or may not be on this call. Tyler Davis recommended to me the work of A. Savanadin, um, a kind of race class theorist uh, who's legendary um, in organized work in the UK. And Savannah uh, anticipated so many of the arguments and problems, say, of DEI culture and its dis disaggregation from what he called what he, a distinction he makes a powerful distinction between what he describes as um, black politics, uh, where where what black names is a form of politics, um, not simply a, a, a color of race. And I want to imagine yellow politics in a similar vein that black and yellow politics what black and yellow name is the site of local forms of domination and oppression, and they open up to forms of liberation. Savannah didn't makes the powerful claim that what happens in neoliberal capitalism is that uh, the black and yellow and black and yellow politics or power 
uh, begin to thin out and name simply the least interesting version of those things, mm -hmm. say uh, skin color. The problem then is that anyone can claim uh, black power politics, um, no matter how far, far entrenched or um, distant they are from actual liberative movements. I think this is a very powerful thing, especially in this moment of extraordinary and seemingly unending violence against Asian Americans. I think uh, there's a script out there that will tempt us towards forms of race nationalism that we want to think hard about. Um, and I think work like Ace of Anadin, as well as certain significant mo moments in Black power movement, um, certain African-American theorists, womanist theorists, uh, certainly communities and, and Latinx communities have thought hard about this question. I'm not sure that those distinctions exist as readily as they need to in our society. Um, I want to call upon uh, Christopher Pei. Do uh, you have a question or comment? Oh, thank you for um, uh, allowing this question. And I um, just want to thank you, Jonathan, for, for the book. Um, I wonder about the um, structures of, of DEI in the community uh, for which they're supposedly accountable. Could you say more about the academic community, the institutionalization of these politics within higher education and how those, where are those trajectories taking us? Where are the cross pressures coming from and where can accountability be, um, I guess, pushed in better directions, I guess is my question. Thank you. Yeah, this is an important question and I'm, I'm guessing one deeply relevant to just about everyone on this call. Um, so I just gave a paper recently on something like why DEI um, tends to fail, how it can work better, um, and then something else. Uh, I mean, there's there's been pretty strong empirical evidence that DEI doesn't work to diversify that in the in in the short and long run. Uh, it's actually counterproductive. Places become less diverse. Um, and if you think just a little bit about moral, how, how psychologies or institutional behavior works, you can probably surmise the reasons why. Uh, it, it begins with what one uh, theorist calls the preemptive double pejorative, um, that uh, you, you try to get people to change by first telling them they're racist or sexist. Um, now, they may be racist or sexist, but telling them beginning with that's probably generally not going to work in institutions. Uh, so uh, a number of uh, theory, I mean, um, empirical sociologists have kind of just shown how this tends to work poorly, but they also offer ways it can work well. But that's not my issue. You know, I, 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 do I think institutions need to work towards this? Obviously, can they do it in better ways? For sure. But there's a deeper question for me about whether even DEI in its best operating form as it's currently conceived gets us to justice or rather, as I said earlier, not simply diverts from justice, but in this is further assault against justice. Um, and so if, if attention to racism, sexism, et cetera, et cetera, is to get into material forms of redistribution, repair, um, then does DEI get us that? Or this is the critical question I raised, does it just make elite institutions more diverse and therefore justify their perpetuation insofar as they have happy people of color faces on them? I think the way many of us experiences is just the raw token, the raw and often unabashed tokenization that goes on in our institutions. But I think we take that as indication that what we need to do is just get more of us in and these are, these are representational politics that John brought up earlier. And I think both John and I would want to ask the question something like, is that it? Um, uh, is, you know, do, they, do these gestures or these mechanisms largely keep the structures and systems in place? They just change the face of them. Um, do they still operate the same in our societies? Uh, and do we just feel better about them insofar as you have, say, a Vietnamese person uh, Vietnamese American person as one of your professors. Um, I think there's significant assumptions about how this can trickle down, but there's, there's pretty little evidence and not only very little evidence, but even very little attempt to study whether these mechanisms do what they're supposed to. 
um, you could think about this as the vulgarization of liberation and justice movements um, to, the low, to their lowest common denominator. Uh, it's what institutions can afford to do for those of us who uh, take place and often lead in these uh, efforts and endeavors. I think we need to, um, you know, be as wise as uh, doves and as shrewd as uh, the other thing uh, in these places and not, um, you know, we go in with our eyes wide open, pushing towards forms of diversity, but pushing harder than what's being offered, what's being put on offer. We have time for one last question, which concerns the title of your book, Asian Americans and the Spirit of Racial Capitalism. So what does the spirit mean in the title? Uh, the spirit is a nod, of course, to Marx and Weber uh, and their critiques of bureaucratic cultures and modern institutions and uh, capitalism. Um, um, Marx, Weber, and, and, and uh, Hegel. Um, it's also a, a nod to the role of religion in the book. Now, the book was supposed to be called Yellow Christianity. <laughs> Uh, the, the very buttoned up, wonderful people at Oxford said that is a completely unworkable title uh, because it would simply be too offensive. And my guess is it wasn't quite searchable. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm fine with that. I mean, um, racial capitalism is a concept that's growing both in the, I mean, it's, it's always been there in the academic discourse, but it's growing uh, in the popular discourse. Uh, and I think this is an important thing and I'm glad to be associated with this, with its growth, even if my association with it is um, hard to track or hard to place. Um, but the spirit is supposed to be indication of the, the, the pedigree of the concepts in the background, the lineage uh, that I try to borrow from and learn from but also an account of the role of religion, um, both in the ideological ideologies of race and, and, and capital, uh, but also the, the productive possibilities. I, I try to tell a story where Christianity is not just the villain. It's a villain, but not just the villain. Uh, and I think this is an important thing to do in an age where, as Dr. Gusto says, it's too easy and too convenient to bash on uh, those who, who um, who find themselves unfortunately under the the, the, the gaze of the academic. So uh, I, I, I try to tell those stories empathetically. Thank you very much. And uh, now I want to uh, invite uh, the director of Kendra Foundry, uh, Dr. Uh, Ryan Bonfilio to tell us about future courses. And he's going to offer us a discount too, uh, Dr. Bonfilio. Thank you, Dr. Kwok and Dr. Tran and everyone else who has been a part of this. It's been wonderful to be able to listen and learn and absorb the wisdom and insights that you all have offered. And we're grateful for everyone who has been here, whether it's late at night or maybe early in the morning for some of you, we're so glad you've come out. Um, as Dr. Kwok said, I direct uh, one of the sponsoring institutions for this uh, book discussion. It's called the Candler Foundry, which uh, our purpose is to try to take the best of what seminary does and bring it outside of the walls of seminary and make it available for churches and communities and people who might never find themselves uh, in a seminary degree program. And we do that in a number of different ways, one of which are short courses uh, that you can take at very little cost and without enrolling in one of our degree programs. We call them courses in the community and we have three coming up. Uh, one of them being Christianity in Asian American history talked by uh, Dr. Timothy Tseng. Another women in the New Testament talked by one of uh, Dr. Kwok and I's uh, colleagues, Susan Highland. And a third one, uh, uh, Acts of the Apostles taught by another one of our New Testament colleagues at Candler. Um, if you are interested in these courses, or maybe for many of you, if you have students uh, or community members or church members who might be interested in doing some more in-depth study at a very low cost uh, and outside of seminaries, we would love to have them join us. Uh, the discount code uh, my colleague Chris has just put in the chat, it's called Candler Foundry. Uh, you can find it there. And if you go to candlerfoundry.emory.edu, you can find these courses and register. So we hope you might take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, but otherwise, thank you all so much for coming. Dr. Kwok, again, for your vision, 
uh, and Dr. Tran for your amazing book. We are grateful for each of you and we hope you uh, are well, uh, stay safe uh, and have a good rest of the night. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Kendra Fondry and the staff, especially uh, Krista uh, Edwards for her help in organizing and providing IT support. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Goodbye.